We are underway, John. How you doing? Good. How are you? I'm okay. I'm all right. This is Glenn Lowry. This is the Glenn Show at bloggingheads.tv and at patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. And I'm with my frequent conversation partner and partner in crime in the Glenn Show 2.0's Patreon persona, John McWhorter. <laughs> John teaches at Columbia University. I teach at Brown University. We're the black guys at bloggingheads.tv. And this is the Glenn Show 2.0. Okay, that's a long introduction because I got a microphone, John, and I like the way it sounds. <laughs> and I'm I got a headset here. I got yeah. boxes on my desktop of amplifiers or modulators or whatever the heck they are. I'm hooked up in a system here in response to our listeners' frequent complaints about the low quality of audio at the Glenn Show. Those of justified you justified complaints, yeah, justified complaints to be sure. Those of you who have elected to support us at patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show are seeing the fruit of your support as manifest in this boom, this arm that I've got here, this mic, and these boxes. And uh, John is mic'd up too. We got a new camera. I don't know if anyone is paying attention to the visual, but if you are, the quality has uh, stepped up considerably. So we're underway, Glenn Show 2.0. Thanks to Eric Vitoff who drove a hundred miles to come to my house and to install this system. He's one of our tech support guys and I appreciate his, I appreciate his help. Um, and so, okay, we're, we're on our way in a new era at the Glenn show. The other thing I want to just mention briefly by way of introduction is that I Glenn Lowry have started a newsletter at Substack. That's glennlowry.substack.com where I will put up musings from time to time, including transcripts of excerpts from episodes at The Glenn Show uh, in the weeks ahead. So if you're curious uh, and interested, uh, check us out at substack.com, glennlowrysubstack.com. Okay, so, John. So Glenn, you know that um, we've, been, we've been disproven. Did you know that Last week, we wound up with egg on our faces. We've been everything that we've been saying for the past 14 years here was disproven last week. I'm not sure how I can go on. I hope there are support groups for people like us because there was this insurrection and the Capitol was overrun and this white mob was not mowed down. And that proves that the cops are racist because it's as clear as that two plus two equals four, that if that had been a black mob, they all would have been shot down instantly like dogs. That's as clear as two plus two was four. So you and I, because we either don't think that there is any racism or we downplay it, it's been proven by that insurrection that there is racism and that the cops are racist and that we were just wrong. You and I were taken completely by surprise, whoops. And I guess now we have to find another line of punditry. Did you did you know that, Glenn? Did you know that that's what happened last week? John, I detect just a bit of sarcasm in your remark. <laughs> <laughs> the, the events of last week, uh, we, we speak here on uh, what day is it? Uh, the 14th of January, a Thursday on Wednesday, the 6th. As everybody in the world knows, the capital of the United States government was overrun by an unruly mob that invaded it violently. People died, property was destroyed. The, vi the visuals are unbelievable. The spectacle is unbelievable. A mob said to have been incited by the words of the president of the United States who has refused to accept his defeat in the election of 2020 and who sent his, uh, his followers, his supporters, rabid supporters uh, down the street in Washington, D.C. to uh, invade uh, at the Capitol on behalf of his claim that the election should not be certified. Um, and you're intimating, John, that some of our detractors, having noticed that the vast majority of those in the Trump supporting mob were white, mm -hmm. have concluded that the line of race commentary that you and I have been engaging in for a decade has been refuted. Mm hmm by the fact that uh, the Trump supporters got out of line, way out of line, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and showed their asses mm-hmm. and desecrated sacred, civically sacred, iconic uh, political uh, monumental monument mm-hmm. um, on behalf of their, you know, their their dead end their pipe dream that somehow the results of the 2020 election could be overturned. And that somehow refutes us. And no, I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that it refuted us. I don't think that it refutes us. I don't think, however, that our reputations or whatever, our discomfort is the main issue here. I mean, our country is in a crisis moment and the main issue is how do we get through it? Uh, you and I can offer our views about that. Uh, I suppose we will do so in, um, in due course. Um, I don't think what happened in Washington, D.C. was a racial issue. I wouldn't want to construe it that way, although perhaps you will disagree. Uh, But in any case, no, no, no. (laughs) What I had to say about uh, the inadequacy of the leadership of African-Americans in the early part of the 21st century here, what I've had to say about the critical importance of personal responsibility, what I've had to say about the overuse, the overuse of a victim framing of African-American strivings uh, uh, in the American political scene, Um, what I've had to say about the dishonesty and uh, disconnect from reality of much of the rhetoric about police violence against black people in the United States and all that, I stand by that. Um, I don't see how it was refuted by what happened last week in Washington. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. There was a, a kind of person out there, you know, it was interesting watching Twitter. I actually sat and watched this time, which I don't usually. As soon as it got ugly, There was a certain kind of person, many of them famous, many of them not, saying, you just know what would have happened if these people were black. It's interesting. It's that lens that they view everything through. And I guess all of us have our hobby horses. And I'm not saying that the race and racism lens isn't important. But as I've said here sometimes, sometimes I wonder, do you think of anything else in this world? Like you, you're letting them win by sitting and thinking only about racism rather than all of what else makes this world interesting. But never mind, I've, I've said that before. But what I want to get across about that is that a lot of people are oversimplifying our views out of this quest that they have to smoke out the heretic. The idea is that if you downplay the fundamental role that racism supposedly plays in every problem that Black people have, you must be called out. And so for many people, And I think partly because they're only listening to us so closely because understandably they find us repulsive, which is something else I've said. I get it. They're not going to follow every little thing we say. They think that we have said that there is no connection between the cops and racism at all. And I would just say for myself that what I'm going by is is data. And if the data show, which they do, that on the average, cops are harder on black people, which they do, then I'm going to listen. I have no reason to sit and deny it. If the data say that nevertheless, the cops do not kill black people disproportionately. And if you adjust for prior criminal record and the fact that there's a disproportion among the black population of 2.5 in terms of cop killings, but then again, black people are also exactly 2.5 more likely to be poor. It's about class and how likely you are to encounter the cops. If you look at it that way, then that's the facts too. And as far as I can see it from what the facts are telling me, it's a reality that I get the feeling it's difficult to quite face amidst the heated feelings of this debate and the sense many people have that this is a matter of smoking out the heretic rather than thinking, frankly, which is the cops are nastier to black people, but they don't kill black people disproportionately. You have to hold those two things in mind. And so it means, I agree. I frankly intuit, and also the data would seem to support, that if that had been a mob of Black Lives Matter protesters who broke through those barricades and started going into the Capitol and desecrating it, et cetera, yeah, I have reason to believe, based on the data, not just my gut, which is not enough, contrary to what a lot of people who speak for Black people and Black people think, the gut's not enough, but also the data suggests that, yeah, those cops would have been harder on them. However, I don't see, I don't feel it in my gut. I would have four or five years ago, but the data don't support that if Black Lives Matter protesters had jumped in there, they would have been mowed down like dogs and killed. And a lot of people think George Floyd. No, folks, 
No. The reason George Floyd died was not because he was black, because, and you can, people just jumping, but, 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 this is the but, folks. You weren't told about Tony Timpa, who was very white and was killed in the exact same way, and there's footage of it. You weren't told. So the reason that I don't think George Floyd died because of his color is because people die in that way all the time. And as for the disproportion, go back to what I said a minute and a half ago. So George Floyd does not tell me that all of those protesters would have been killed. I don't I don't think they would have. I don't intuit it that way. And more to the point, nothing proves it. Anybody's gut instinct that that's what would have happened because they're black or because they feel it a moral duty to support what certain kinds of black people say. I'm sorry, that's not reasoning. And you have to look at the data. And Glenn, I have 15 more seconds. The thing is, the assumption that Glenn and I don't follow the data is interesting. Remember when I said the thing some weeks ago about how everybody thinks sociology is so easy? Why would we be sitting here and saying these things if we hadn't followed what other people are saying? It's just not that simple. And I know I'm not God, but I was disappointed that so many people thought, there go Glenn and John as if we're just sitting here like Uncle Ruckus in the boondocks and shooting off our mouths out of our gut feelings. That's not what I do. Is, is that what you do, Glenn? <laughs> no, it's not what I do. I've got a long track record showing that it's not what I do. But I <laughs> want to say a couple of things. Watching Twitter, this is just a throwaway. That's an interesting way of putting it. And I know what you mean in the sense that Twitter is so spontaneous and, uh, and dynamic that you can literally put up something and then sit and watch what happens after you putting up and you can watch <laughs> the likes scrolling up and you can see the comments coming in and <laughs> things like that. And I can see where that could become easily very uh, addictive. A waste of time, but it yeah, can be exciting yeah, too. A terrible mm -hmm. waste of time. Second thing I just wanted to point out in passing is that amongst the people who called attention to this hypothetical, this counterfactual, if the Capitol rioters had been mostly black rioting on behalf of a, a dispute or a policy matter that uh, entailed race and racism, they would have been mowed down like dogs. That, that counterfactual among the people entertaining it was uh, President-elect Joseph Biden, who made a statement to that effect. Um, how do I react to that? I first, I don't react to it personally. I don't think I need to defend myself. I'm not, I'm not going to, uh, take the bait, you know, you Uncle Tom Negroes, you see, you see, this proves you wrong, this proves you wrong, it doesn't prove me wrong. I don't have to react to that kind of uh, uh, provocation. I do. Um, the, no one was shot by a police officer during all of the riots that went on in the summer after George Floyd was That's killed. That's important. Yeah. Uh, yeah a woman, a, a Trump supporter was shot out. in that Capitol. Um, Th there was plenty of restraint. That was, in fact, one of the issues of uh, not only federal, but of state and local law enforcement not applying the full force of the law in the face of a police station being burnt to the ground in Minneapolis or a courthouse being held under siege in Portland, et cetera, et cetera. And surely the spectacle of a Kent state-like, quote unquote, massacre of black protesters by white uh, officers of authority, whether it be the National Guard or the local gendarme, that Has spectacle, it loomed in the mind, it had to, did it not, of decision makers, that's the one thing we can't have, the one thing that we can't have right now, the one thing that will cause the situation to spiral out of control would be the use of deadly force against racial uh, rights and uh, you know justice, racial justice protesters. I'm sure that that loomed foremost in the minds of many of the key decision makers at the time. When Trump decided to clear an area around the White House so that he could walk across to that church that had been vandalized and hold up a Bible, a despicable stunt, okay? He oughtn't to have done it. And when he enlisted the support of the U.S. military and military command authority to accompany him on that jaunt, um, I don't recall anybody being uh, bludgeoned. I don't recall anybody, black, white, or otherwise, being shot. There was some um, uh, tear gas or whatever was used to help to dispel the crowd. And that drew withering critical comment from uh, the media and, and, and other observers. So why go down that rabbit hole if they had been black then? Why make it into a racial issue? Why would you take something as gravely serious 
and the implications that it conveys for the instability of American politics and the fragility of American political institutions like that event of January 6th in the Capitol. Why take something like that and make a racial issue out of it? It's an issue for the country. It's our democracy that's at stake here. Those rabbit rioting protesters are at a continuum, it seems to me, with those who were protesting for racial justice, burning and looting in the cities of America. They are not events, these two, the race rioting of the summer and the pro-Trump rioting of last week are not uh, two different uh, issues. They're not two things to be weighed or compared on the scale. They are, it seems to me, are part of a continuum of a disturbing set of developments in the American political culture, which threaten all of us, regardless of our color. That's how I would be inclined to respond. Yeah, and I want to be fair to the critics here. Many of them say that the issue is that if the people were black, there certainly would have been more tear gassings and, and rubber bullets. And so it wouldn't necessarily have been that everybody would have been machine gunned down to the floor, but that there would have been more, more of a punitive response. And you know, I don't, I don't deny it. Yeah, tear gas and rubber bullets. But like you're saying, the idea that they're gonna mow everybody down, if anything, just pragmatics would make people not do that. And we know that because black people protesting have not been being killed in huge numbers or in any numbers by the cops since last spring. That's not what's been happening. But even if you talk about the, the tear gas and the rubber bullets on that, yeah, I, I can go with you. But then on the other hand, yeah, I was um, thrown and I shouldn't have been, I'm not now, but I was thrown by people immediately thinking about the black angle of that very white event because yeah, something hideous was happening in terms of our democracy, in terms of basic electoral procedure. We were watching history being unmade there. And then a lot of people are thinking about Black Lives Matter. But I would say that the reason it was racialized for so many people is because we have democracy as a founding principle, but among the enlightened class in America, anti-racism is the religion, literally. And so, of course, when that happens, people are going to start thinking about their relationship to God, except it isn't God. It's the anti-racist commitment. I understand that. I can comprehend where that comes from. I found it one more illustration of how deeply imprinted a certain segment of America is with that particular quest. But, yeah, I don't I don't. Um, the idea that we've been deep six doesn't work for me. I think that the offensive idea in a nutshell is that we are saying that racist discrimination and or the results of it in how society works are not the answer to every black problem and that they are not the cause of a great many black problems, at least not to any extent that we can expect policy to be based on. And so if we're talking about racism 100 years ago or 50 years ago that's left legacies, to talk about how we have to combat racism to solve the problem is a little abstract, not to mention that it wouldn't actually help anybody who needs help. I think that's a fair description of what you and I have said. And what hap what did not happen to that mob leaves all of those things intact, talking about school performance, why there aren't more black kids in STEM, you know, why there are black health care disparities, why there is a wage gap if there is, et cetera. All of these things are much more complicated then that white people don't like black people or white people don't like black people and it has certain results in the way procedure works, i.e. systemic racism. So it's not that we don't know what systemic racism is or what it refers to. We're saying that we have addressed all of those things. We've looked at those arguments and we find them unconvincing for reasons that we've tried to get across. I get a little impatient with people who seem to actually think, actually think, they actually think this. They think that we need to be taught that racism can be systemic. It's especially appalling with you. Do they really think, you know, that you're older than me and you are an economist. They really think you don't know. And then with me, they think they need to sit my bougie ass down and tell me about systemic racism. <laughs> no, folks, we know. 
We've we've heard it. We you have a way of putting things, John. <laughs> you, you, you have a way of putting things. Your bougie ass. I love that. Uh, no, they what haven't read. They haven't read the anatomy of racial inequality. Uh, they haven't read race incarceration and American values. If they think mm-hmm. I don't know what systemic racism, but I. Uh, but there's a couple things I want to say. One is. You in this mea culpa moment, you know, the moment when the black guys at bloggingheads.tv, the contrarians, the quote unquote conservatives are uh, being expected to apologize because the Trump supporters white have gone mad. And and I think you've dispatched that expectation perfectly adequately. I have nothing more to add to it. I say I'm not going down that rabbit hole. However, there is something of the mea culpa variety that I think has to be entertained here. What? Glenn Lowry, Trump apologist. Oh yeah. Right. In other words, whenever <laughs> we would Twitter have a, whenever whenever we would have a talk about Trump, you would be in the position. He's a buffoon. He's a jackass. He's an idiot. He's a monster. He's a moron. He's a child. And I would be saying something like, "Well, wait a minute, John. You just you know, I know you live uh, wherever you live in New York City, and." You got to maintain your viability within your social circle. And, you know, you, you, you know, so you have to spot these kind of things. But I mean, how can he be so stupid if he's been so successful in his political career? And how can you know, and I'm mean, give the man the benefit of the doubt. He is the president. Of the United. He has tens of millions of people who believe in him. He's their tribune. Have some respect for them if you don't have any respect for him. He's not that bad. You exaggerated. He didn't at Charlottesville. He didn't support the white supremacy. I've been heard to say all of this kind of stuff. OK. <laughs> now, there are many people, I don't read Twitter as much as you do, but I, I couldn't help but see this. who are saying, see there, Glenn Lauer, you are dead wrong about Trump, and this is a cost to the country. I told you, there are many never Trumpers who said he was unsuitable to be in the office. He was unfit for the office. His characterological flaws disqualified him from the office. There are many people like Andrew Sullivan who said that his election was an existential threat to the integrity of American democracy or words to that effect. And here we are now with our democracy on edge, to be sure, uh, in substantial part because of the actions of Donald Trump in the face of his defeat. Uh, And a person could well say to Glenn Lowry, see there, I told you. See there, I told you. They could. This is blood. You got blood on your hands indirectly because they might even be thinking about deplatforming me. They, they, they might be thinking about putting me on that enemies list because there are enemies lists being drawn up even as we speak. You know that, don't you, John? You of, mean a, uh, a list of witches, right? Yeah. Yeah, witches, man. Senators, U.S. senators, uh, state reps who might have said something on the floor of their particular uh, state's uh, legislative house where it was uh, supportive of Trump. Lawyers. Mm-hmm. Lawyers who people are going to say should be disbarred. I wouldn't want to have uh, any significant investment in Rudy Giuliani stock at this moment, if you see what I'm saying. (laughs) Yeah. And that enemy's list is going to extend. People are scrubbing their social media files. Not me. Uh, I can't anyway. There's no way I could scrub all my pro-Trump, Trump apologetics uh, off of my uh, off of my uh, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and other accounts. I'm out there. I'm out there. Um, And there are people scrubbing files and there are people combing through the files, trying to find incriminating evidence. People are losing their jobs. That's another thing. I don't recall any African-American. I could be wrong. Tell me that I'm wrong. Whose employer fired them because they could be facially identified in a photo of people surging at the uh, police uh, barricaded, uh, you know, or in a crowd that got unruly and arson broke out and or where bricks were being thrown at police officers and a person was seen. in. I don't remember any such person being fired. A lot fired, of them probably got promotions. Yeah. Fired from their job or in other ways uh, having their livelihood interrupted because they were seen to have participated in the protest. And if they were, they would have been a cost celeb around whom would have gathered the entire liberal establishment of this country to assert correctly their right of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. This is not excusing anybody who's actually committing criminal acts. I'm just saying being a part of a demonstration, marking you as somehow unfit for employment or association. I don't remember that happening in uh, the uh, case of the race riots in the summer after George Floyd was killed, Mm -mm. Uh, Mm -hmm. but it's happening now and it's going to happen with a vengeance 
uh, people are making open political statements. Let's not forget. We must never let them forget. We must scar and mark them forever. Um, if they if they did what? If they said they thought that there were irregularities warranting significant investigation in the 2020 election. Mind you, now, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying a person could say it. Mm -hmm. that, that's not seditious. It's not seditious to wonder whether or not irregularities ought to be investigated in an electoral process. There are irregularities all the time in elections, et cetera. I'll stop. Because if I continue to talk in that vein, I'll be marking myself as one of these uh, rebels or one of these uh, people who have no respect for the Constitution. But it, we've gotten to the point now where even to raise a question of that sort um, is uh, is uh, career threatening uh, for uh, for people. And I don't recall that as having happened before. But let me not let me not mince words. And I know I've been talking for a while, John. I was wrong about the threat that Donald Trump posed to American democracy. I underestimated wow. that threat. Now, I don't know for sure that the election was in every respect on the up and up in every state in which disputes have been raised. I don't know that for sure. I don't know it. None of us know it. None of us know it. We have faith in the system the same way that we believe when we go in for brain surgery and we don't know a damn thing about neurology that it's going to be okay. When we get on an airplane and we know absolutely nothing about avionics, that it's going to be okay. We basically have to trust institutions. The courts have vetted many of the claims that Trump supporters have made in the aftermath of this election. He's gotten no traction. He's got no support from the sources of political authority that he might have looked to in the Republicans and in the and, and in the um, state houses and so forth for his uh, dead ender uh, policy. He lost the election, whether it was stolen from him or not. I happen not to know. He lost the election. That's what I do know. I do know that the social fact of him having lost the election is a fact. Just as many people say that Richard Nixon had that election stolen from him in 1960 by shenanigans in the state of Illinois on behalf of the John F. Kennedy campaign. Mm -hmm. Just as many people believe that Al Gore had that election stolen from him in Florida in 2000 uh, because of the recounting uh, shenanigans and the role that the Supreme Court played in bringing the recount to a halt in Florida, a very close election. Those guys lost those elections in the sense that to have continued to persist in objecting to the electoral outcome would have despoiled American democracy. And they were sufficiently civic minded enough to stand aside. Trump should have stood aside. If they stole it from him, they stole it fair and square and it was stolen. There was nothing that could be done about that. Nothing good could have come of his persistence in the path that he chose. Nothing but destruction could follow from him having chosen that path. I don't believe, and I'll say this, that Trump and the remarks that he made before that crowd descended on the Capitol incited insurrection. I think that that's hyperbole. But he certainly played with fire and he ended up getting burned by it and the country even more badly burned. And a bigger man, I'm saying it now, can you hear me? A bigger man would have stood aside and accepted the outcome in the interest of the country regardless of the doubts that he and his people may have had about it. Perhaps there should have been a commission to investigate whether or not the move to mail-in balloting in the scope and extent that occurred because of COVID uh, posed threat to the security of the election in such a way that one wants to consider whether or not to adopt that as an ongoing way of carrying on elections. That's a perfectly legitimate thing to investigate. But tying that to um, holding up the inauguration of Joseph Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, uh, tying that to the resolution of this essential right of American democracy and asking for extra legal, even Mike Pence couldn't be persuaded to go along, means to be employed in order to stop the enactment of the natural processes of American democracy when you do not have the evidence on your side to justify your perhaps legitimate suspicions. That was a, 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 an act of uh, a destructive and ill-considered act of narcissism uh, and personal aggrandizement at the expense of the republic.
and it deserves to be condemned. I was wrong. Glenn, did you really not see this nature of him before? You know, consider also the lack of remorse since then. I mean, this is a truly narcissistic, empty, heartless being. You didn't see that until now? This is a genuine, genuine question. My, now that we have to, <laughs> I'm sorry that you invite us to rehearse what I said, but let me just say what I said. I said, Trump's personality is a second order issue. Mm -hmm. I don't know how intelligent he is. You're, you're, you're convinced he's stupid. I don't know if he's stupid or not. How stupid could he be? Uh, you say he's venal and you say he's a child. I say all of this ad hominem about Trump misses the point that large forces are at play in American democracy. The tectonic plates, the tectonic plates are shifting. It's the kind of thing that Michael Sandel talks about in his brilliant uh, new book, uh, the, the Tyranny of Merit, where, I mean, I, I won't go into the book. Uh, I'm gonna discuss it with Michael at some point in the future on the Glenn Show here. But I mean, the basic argument is that around the world we see populist uprisings and right-wing governments coming into power and unsettled uh, politics in democratic countries from the right because a dispossessed class of people who've been rendered economically inviolable by globalization are not finding anybody who speaks on their behalf and because the elites who are benefiting from globalization concentrated in the coastal cities in the united states and on the left of our politics uh don't have any kind of politics of solidarity in which their good fortune is shared with the rest of the polity. And that's provoked a, a certain kind of reaction. Uh, I thought Trump's uh, arrival signaled a coming to terms with the inadequacy of, of, of American governance on behalf of many people. And I'm not talking mainly about whites, I'm talking about people, not just white people, who uh, felt that the government didn't speak for them. Trump was shaking things up. I wanted things to be shaken up and I wanted the conversation to be about that. He says, America first, let's talk about that. You don't like it? Okay, let's talk about America first. That's the wrong way to think about our role in the world. He says, we need a border. Okay, let's talk about that. You don't think we need a border? You think we need a different kind of border? Then we need to talk about that. He says, the cities are going to hell in a handbasket led by Democrats. You don't like that? Let's have a debate about the governance of the cities. Let's have a debate about American education. Let's have a debate about taxes and growing the economy. Let's have a debate about China. Let's debate those things where Trump is shaking things up. I like that things are being shaken up. I didn't really trust the settled establishment of Democratic and re Republican elites who kind of govern from the center of American politics. I don't like political correctness. I don't like cancel culture, uh, et cetera. I thought Colin Kaepernick had his head up his ass. I'll say that. I thought the whole, you know, so so Trump was shaking things up. I wanted things to be shaken up. You wanted to make the, con not you personally. Y'all wanted to make the conversation about him being an idiot and a jackass. I wanted to make the conversation about the tectonic plates of American political economy uh, shifting below our feet. In which yeah. way should we be trying to go? Trump will come and Trump will go, but the underlying structural problems will remain with us. Let's not waste our time talking about Trump. That's what I thought. And I'm saying I was wrong, okay? Yeah. I'm saying I underestimated this thing that my friend Stephen Tellis, the political scientist, and I'll stop, John, I know I'm going on for a long time, uh, is always saying, which is that the institutions require, in order to function, not just de jure, not just the law, not just the rules, but also the spirit, people who occupy office have to come into that office because they have so much discretion, so much is secret and beyond what we can see in the newspaper about what's going on. So much depends upon the mood and tone and intent and so on, that we need good people, people of character holding these offices to complement the good institutional structures in order to produce good governing outcomes. And what disqualifies this guy, says a guy like Stephen Tellis, who wrote a book about the Never Trumpers, a very sympathetic book about the Never Trumpers, is that he doesn't have those qualities of character, which are a requisite uh, concomitant to our rules, you know, three branches of government, a constitution, et cetera. There's a lot of stuff that's just custom, a lot of stuff that's just, you don't do it. We don't do it like that. That's not how the way we do it. He was running afoul of all of that stuff. 
and Steve and many others were alarmed by the fact that a loose cannon untethered by convention and by respect for tradition would uh, maybe bend the rules to a way that uh, was never uh, intended or mm -hmm. uh, in other ways find a way of subverting the rules on behalf of his own ambition. And I poo pooed that. I said, nah, nah, nah. Character, character. If you don't like him, vote him out. But meanwhile, can we talk about America first? Can we talk about the border? Can we talk and about Black Lives Matter? Can we talk about whatever? He's not wrong about everything. Let's talk about those right. things. And I was mistaken in underestimating the characterological flaws and the consequences of those flaws for the stability of American government. I said, oh, no, 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 no. Nobody can deny the outcome of an election. I thought to myself, the courts will never stand for it. Well, I mean, to a way, I'm validated by that because he is on his way out. He's not... Uh, able to affect the coup d'etat, uh, et cetera. Well, you know, Glenn, I think you also, I understand what you're saying. I'm glad. I and hope everybody also, does. Also, <laughs> you had a, a hope for debate that reveals you as in some ways less disillusioned than I am in that I think we've seen over the past four years that there was no way to have that debate that you're talking about with educated America, because educated America's religion is anti-racism. And so two thirds of what anybody wanted to say in response to anything Trump said was look at the ways in which he's a racist. Here's how we show that he's a racist, even if he doesn't use the N-word, et cetera. That is most of what people wanted to talk about. There were people talking about his character, et cetera. But the debate that you're, you were looking for, and I remember you know, when we would talk about the wall and the debate that one might have, when we were talking about you know, the cities and the debate that one might have. It would require, for example, maybe Biden to get people to talk about things like that without being focused on smoking out the racism in the messenger. Because when you have somebody like Trump with all of those dog whistles and sometimes, you know, just outright yelps, that was all anybody was going to want to talk about. And so there was no debate that was going to be had. But what moves me about these people is you're saying, you know, they're running up the steps they believe that the election has been stolen. And the simple fact is that it's clear that that's not the case. If that's the case, then a bunch of very sophisticated and talented people have been doing some really top quality hiding and skullduggery. The facts are, are clear, and yet it's obvious that nothing would convince these people. And what that means is, and here's where I get boring, they're religious too. You know, Trump has, a, has attracted a religious cult around him. That's a lot of this Q Anon stuff. And these people can't be spoken to. And what I saw in the people running up the steps convinced that this election is stolen in the face of simple fact, not to mention, you know, intuitiveness and common sense, was not people who aren't black and therefore aren't being killed. That wasn't what I saw when I saw the first footage. What I thought was these people and the hard woke left are variations on the same thing. If you really think here in the middle of this January that the election was stolen, you are impervious to fact. You are using a whole different part of your brain that evolved among hunter gatherers 300,000 years ago. If you really believe that every problem that black America has reduces to something called racism, and you take that word and you massage its definition to the point that you can use it to quote unquote explain everything or you know, to pull the camera back. If the way you look at what goes on in the United States is that everything is about the oppression coming from a cis heteronormative, what is it? Cis heteronormative hegemony. The idea being, you know, there's a whole book that's actually defending looting. It is, um, I for, the first name of the person is Vicky. I forget her last name. She Eisenberg. had a piece in the New York Times to this effect. Yeah, there, there's a whole book in defense, in defense of, of, looting, of looting. The idea, yeah. cis heteronormative hegemony. <laughs> if that's the way you look at things, and I'm not singling her out, that's religious too. You, you've got it all figured out based on a very small package of observations. It's the same thing. The question here is what creates this religious kind of thought, what makes it attractive? And as I've said, part of it is that you like belonging to a group. Part of it is that it feels good to have things figured out. It's not that the people are just stupid. Not that many people are stupid, but it's a phenomenon. I saw people running up the steps and I thought these are the same people 
as the ones who, you know, at various places in Boston University are chasing people out of their jobs based on the idea that they are not battling the cis heteronormative hegemony enough. Seeing this sort of thing all over the country, it's the same thing. It's just different beliefs, what you choose to coalesce around. And it's, it's scary. What worries me is that the woke left is going to pull something like that. They wouldn't storm the Capitol. But I wonder what that kind of person might do that could be equally scary. I worry. I genuinely worry. And I shouldn't say it because somebody might listen to me and then go do it. Some is going to be a guy. He's going to be roughly from 18 to 36, who is a very woke, hard left kind of person an Antifa sort of person who's going to do something with a gun and call himself doing it in the name of fighting for black people and be a, being a good anti-racist. So what I'm seeing is religion in this country has changed. It's not about Christianity anymore. It's about these cults you know, of wokeness on the left, wokeness on the right. It's distressing. That's what I saw running up the steps, not well, people, people who weren't black. Okay, a um, couple of things. Uh, people with guns have already spoken. They just haven't assassinated a high level political figure. Cops have been killed sitting in their cars by people with guns motivated along the lines that you talk about. Of course, they're not the only people being killed and they're not the only people with guns. And I dare say there are a lot more guns in the hands of uh, right wing extremists than there are in the hands of, you know, black radicals. Um, I imagine a, it being a white a, radical. To tell that's you the a truth. graver. Oh, I see. Um, the other thing I want to say is I don't think I necessarily agree that it's so clear that there were no uh, irregularities uh, that one should be concerned about in the election. I just think it's clear that whatever irregularities there may have been, and I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole of, you know, all of the various, some more conspiracy theoretic than other concerns, whatever irregularities they might have been, they have been vetted by the only processes we have available to vet them, which is the courts. Uh, and evidence hasn't been presented that they are of so sufficient uh, nature as to warrant uh, interrupting the process of transition of power away from Donald Trump and to Joseph Biden. So a person well might harbor the view, as many do, as I say, about the 2000 election stolen from Albert Gore or about the 1960 election stolen from Richard Nixon. Um, they nevertheless, whatever the view that you might have about the likelihood that some shenanigans went on in the electoral process, you have no alternative but to trust the resolution of those disputes as rendered by duly constituted courts of law. And when they've spoken, the conversation is over, at least as far as governing the country is concerned. Folk wisdom may still have people exchanging among themselves stories and tales about what happened in Philadelphia or Detroit or Atlanta or any place else in terms of how ballots were handled and this or that irregularity, because there are irregularities. There are irregularities in every election. Um, rarely will they be of such a nature and extent as to rise to the level of disrupting the process of electoral transition of power. I will point out that Stacey Abrams of Georgia to this day uh, refuses to concede that she lost to Brian Kemp uh, in that gubernatorial election because she felt that the system was cooked against her by Republican uh, decision on electoral processing that uh, in effect disqualified or are barred from being able to cast their votes of uh, people who would have supported her. She's perfectly entitled to have that belief. What she's not entitled to do is to lead a mob on the uh, Georgia State House to demand that uh, the electoral process not enshrine uh, the winner, quote unquote, winner of that election as the governor. That is beyond the pale. And that's what has happened here. So uh, I think it's quite all right for some uh, Trump uh, never, never, uh, you know, diehards, uh, with Trump to the end, people to say, I think the election was stolen from my president. I think that's OK. I think what's not OK is to say, therefore, let's uh, act against the government of the United States of America. Joe Biden is not the legitimate president of the United States, because the only way we have of resolving these matters has been uh, pursued and the result is in. That is clear. What's clear is that the courts have not upheld any of the claims. That's clear. Uh, doesn't mean that all those claims are false. Uh, but it does mean that Joe Biden is supposed to be, will be, and should be uh, accepted as the next president of the United States. That's something that Trump and the people who attacked that, uh, uh, the Capitol uh, on January 6th have refused to do.
You know, actually, I'm thinking we should signal something because um, our critics, and I mean, you know, very intelligent and justified critics yeah. are going to seize on something you said. And they're, I think there are people who are going to think we don't know. And we're responsible for showing that we know, okay. which is that you were talking about the dispossessed kind of white person. I always make it this, this woman who runs a liquor store in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, but that person. I think we need to be clear that we know that the mob did not consist only of those people. I think Adam Serwer has a piece in the Atlantic about this. And in general, those weren't poor and working class people only who ran up the steps. And sure. for many people, the fact that there were, you know, bourgeois and affluent people in that group shows once again that it must be all about racism. These people don't feel dispossessed. They're not having money problems. And so what they're fighting for is the white America that they wish would come back, et cetera. But the point is, we do not think that the people running up the steps all were shelf stalkers at Staples. No, that is not what was going on. Still, <laughs> I don't agree with many people's take on the story regardless, but we should we should get that in because I think that there are a lot of people, and I try to understand, who think that if we don't think the way they do, it's because we're ignorant. Whereas these matters, I don't think they're rocket science, but they're not as simple as many people seem to think. And many people seem to think that if you know what systemic racism is, then you are going to have all of the same conclusions that they do and that they just need to inform you of that gospel or have you burnt at the stake if you refuse to believe it. It's just not that simple. So I just wanted to get that in because I can imagine the thread in the discussion where everybody reminds us of this. And yeah, I just want to say to people, we're aware of, of that about the mob. It was socioeconomically quite, quite diverse. Okay. Now here's a point that you and I may have uh, some difference of view about, and that's the impeachment of Donald Trump. Today is January 14th. Yesterday, the Congress the House of Representatives impeached the president for the second time. Um, and uh, the uh, inauguration is the 20th, if I'm not mistaken. That's six mm -hmm. days from now on Wednesday of next week. Trump has six days or less uh, to serve as president. And they started a process to remove him from office. Seems impossible that the process could be complete before the actual inauguration. And so impeachment would extend over the trial in the Senate, that is to say, would extend over into the new administration and would have to be carried out after Trump has uh, left office. Now, setting aside the legal technicalities about whether or not you can do that, I gather the opinion, the consensus opinion is that you can legally do that. There's a question of the wisdom of it. And while I don't have a firm view here, I am, I am skeptical about the wisdom of pursuing this line. And I'm thinking, look, let's get him out of office and get on with the work of the country. Let's not do Trump for another three months after the inauguration of Joseph Biden. I understand that people are furious. I understand that people want him to be punished as an example, so as not to go without having been held accountable for his actions. I've already said what I think about his actions, okay? And I, don't, I won't repeat myself. Despicable and contemptuous of the interest of the country. That's what I think about his actions. I don't think he incited the riot, but I think the riot was part of the fire that he's been playing with for a while, and he deserves to have been burnt by it. Um, but I wanna get this behind us. I don't wanna carry this forward. And I don't want to make a martyr out of him. I have to, and I don't know for sure what's the right thing to do here, but the guiding principle should be what is in the best interest of the country. So when Mike Pence, the vice president, uh, declined to pursue the 25th Amendment disqualification of Trump in the last days of his presidency for his unfitness to serve, saying that he didn't think it was in the best interest of the country, not addressing the merits of Trump. I was relieved, frankly, that he said that and thought that sounds like the wiser course. I wonder if there are any Democrats, certainly not Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, and I don't blame them. They were the ones having to metaphorically hide under their desk while these rampagers went up and down the hallways of the Capitol building. But wise heads ought to be thinking about the country right now. 
And I'm not sure continuing to litigate this is in the interest of the country. I'm not sure. I have my doubts. I'm skeptical about it. I'm skeptical about the spirit of vengefulness that wants to make up list and go McCarthyite because it is McCarthy-esque down the list. Where were you on the moment of, you know, who did you say and did you actually support the and then and what were your speeches? And, 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 you know, you are a junior insider and we're going to just, you know, I think that's be very bad for the country. Um, I respectfully disagree. I, I, um, I signed a letter, a bunch of historians signed a letter arguing for impeachment and I was treated as a historian and I decided to pretend to be one because I play one on TV sometimes and I did, <laughs> I did sign it. And um, my interest is not in pointing the finger. And of course there was some of that. The idea is we must indicate our disapproval of this person. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we did that 10 minutes ago. Do we really need to do it again when he's going to be out in five minutes? I, I get that. But to the extent that the impeachment process, especially if it goes further than it's gone at this point, and even just for the symbolic reasons, if it just stays where it is now, to the extent that it keeps him from running again, from being able to serve, it's vital because that man is, and this isn't just nya nya name calling, he is a narcissist. He is a clinical narcissist. And as such, to have lost like this is utterly intolerable. He doesn't even like being president, but the idea that he was repudiated will just sit with him as an, as an unresolved cord. He just can't have it. He'll run again. And because he's attracted a religious cult, and because apparently to be a modern Republican is to be able to look yourself in the mirror, caving in to someone like him, as long as it's your party that's in power, he could win again. There's a cult of personality around him. If the best they can do next time is Marco Rubio, Trump could win again. And to the extent that we can keep that from happening, I think maybe you and I both agree now that that man has no business being president of the United States. And yet he's gonna to wanna to try again. Here's what I wanna say, John. I don't disagree with what you said. He is gonna to wanna to try again. And he could win. Mm -hmm. And that would not be good. It'd be but a the, horror show. But the solution is to persuade a majority of our fellow voters that that's the case. The, the disqualification doesn't work. I mean, trivially, it doesn't work. Don Jr. runs as a surrogate. Mm -hmm. and, and the party gets formed with Trump, the obvious uh, 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 you know, patron, and Don Jr., the figurehead expression, and everyone who casts a vote for Don Jr. is, in effect, voting for Trump. And when Don Jr. wins, if he wins, Trump, quote unquote, is back in power. You, you, can't, you can't kill this thing by just chopping off its head. You, you've got to get to the root of it. You've got to persuade people of the point, I think, I think I say this immodestly, that I was just making, which is that the country was endangered by what it is that Donald Trump did. Bringing him back to power puts the country at grave risk. Disqualifying him because you happen to have a majority in the two houses of the US Congress at the moment. So you disqualify him, but you haven't killed Trumpism. You don't kill Trumpism until you talk to the 70 million people who voted for him and get at least 15 or 20 million of them to agree with you. That's the that's the task at hand. There's no shortcut around it, except even if Trump were pulling the strings, there wouldn't be a personality cult around Don Jr. He has the charisma of a kitchen cabinet. He wouldn't be considered as exciting. And so there'd be less of a chance that he would wind up in office. And, you know, if he did it. He would not be the most competent president in the world, but I imagine he would do a better job of at least going through the motions of being a thinking statesman than his father was capable of. His father was a true aberration, a truly unusual circumstance. Don Jr. is a, is a grown up. So that doesn't worry me as much as just making sure that the particular person of Donald Trump doesn't wind up in the Oval Office again, because it was a terrible mistake, a real a real disaster. So yeah, I would say let's make it so that he absolutely can't. So that, you know, at best, 
he can try to get one of his minions in. What what you're not taking on board is that by doing that, by disqualifying him through manipulation of the legal and political process, you only add fuel to the cult's fire. Hmm. They won't let me serve my son, Don Jr. He won't make a decision without consulting with me. Hmm. Don Jr. stands up Hmm. and says, my dad, the great uh, patron of our movement, uh, of course I will consult with him before I do anything uh, uh, in this office. Vote for me is a way of indirectly telling those Democrats to go <laughs> themselves, et cetera. I don't, I just think it's a hard, here's what I'm saying. This is a very a difficult problem for the country. There are no shortcuts. We have somehow got to find a way of reconciling the differences between these parts of our polity, which are fueled by the partisanship of the media and by the uh, unprincipled behavior of certain politicians, Donald J. Trump primary among them. It's a serious problem. We got to talk to the voters uh, in, in order to, to solve it, I think. Because of some of the things we've been saying, I worry that there's so many voters who can't be reached, <laughs> um, both on that side and on the left. But here we're talking about yeah. the idea that an actual functioning human being can walk around believing in Q. You know, these are pe- college educated people, people who walk around taking care of their taxes and getting yeah. second mortgages who actually believe that. Yeah. And it's it's growing. So I worry about the wisdom of crowds sometimes, but I know that we have to at least pretend because that's what this is supposed to be all about. But it's tough stuff. It is. I'm going to let you have the last word, John, Glenn and John, The Glenn Show, every two weeks here at bloggingheads.tv and at patreon.com forward slash Glenn Show. By the way, folks, I'm on my book. You will know next time. It's now down to the wire. I will let you know next time how you will read this book, but I can't tell you right now. John writes faster than I can talk. I don't know what to say. (laughs) (laughs) Except congratulations, John. (laughs) I can't wait to see it, man. (laughs) Tell you about it next time. All right.